Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, find all people with secret. We're given an integer n, which represents people numbered from zero to n minus one. We're also given an array of meetings where a meeting consists of one person, let's call that X, and another person, let's call that Y, and a third parameter, T, which tells us the time that that meeting takes place at. Now, before I explain this parameter in depth, we're given a third parameter called first person. So basically the way this problem works is that initially person zero, which they mention over there, and the first person, which is a second parameter to us. So let's say in this example here, the first person is one. So initially these two people, zero and one have a secret. The secret is gonna be spread via these meetings. That is the other parameter here. Looking at the example down here, we have person one, is gonna have a meeting with person two at time equals five. Among all of these meetings, this is the first meeting that is taking place. We know initially these two people have the secret, and when we have a meeting like this one, it means that the secret is now going to be communicated from person one to person two. You can almost think of this as like a graph rather than like the meeting interval problems that we would see, even though there is definitely a time element to this. Now, one quick clarification I want to make is that this is actually not directed. They mention it in the fine print right over here. I actually missed it when I was first trying to solve the problem. If we had put these in the opposite order, if we had put person two first and then person one second, the secret can still be communicated in this direction as well. So think of this as an undirected edge. So that's very important to note. Now let's look at the second meeting. Over here, we can see a second meeting takes place at time eight communicated with these two people. Now you tell me, does a secret spread via this meeting? Well, either person two communicates it with person three or person three communicates it with person two. From the first meeting that occurred, we actually increased our set of people with the secret from just these two. And now we've added this other person as well. So yes, person two now communicated the secret with person three. And this is only because the time here happened after the time here. If these meetings happened in the opposite order, if this meeting happened at time equals eight and this one happened at time equals five, well, this meeting happens first, person two and three, neither of them know the secret, so nothing happens here. And this happens at time eight, well, person one does know the secret, so they tell person two. So this is different. If the meetings were in the original order that I showed, we actually end up like this. We end up two knowing the secret and now three also knows the secret. So this is now the set of people with the secret. Our goal is just to, by the end of all of these meetings, return all the people with the secret. And there's one last thing, because right now, believe it or not, the problem is relatively trivial. But there's one little twist that they throw at us, and that is the secrets are shared instantaneously. Let me show you what they mean by that. I think it's already pretty clear that we'd probably want to iterate over the meetings in sorted order based on the time, because of course the order that the meetings happen in does matter. But when they say that secrets can be shared instantaneously, that means that a person who receives the secret at a certain point in time can share the secret at that exact same time. So take a look at this example over here. All of these meetings occur at time equals five. Let's go through them in this particular order that I've listed. Person two and three share the secret. Well, neither of them know the secret. Person three and four share the secret at the same time. Neither of them know the secret. Now, person one and two share the secret and one has the secret, so they share it with person two. So now our set ends up looking like this. Theoretically, since this meeting happens at the same time as these two meetings, now person two should be allowed to share it with three. So we should be able to add three here. And then person three should be able to share it with person four. So we can add it here as well. But that is only if we go through the elements in a particular order. We have to do this one, then this one, and then this one. Well, when we sort based on time, there's no guarantee that the elements are gonna show up in that order. So we have to think about this in a different way. And believe it or not, no matter how you sort it, it won't matter. It won't guarantee anything. So the best way to do this is to think about it in terms actually of a graph. Think about it like this. This is our set of people with the secret. 
One shares the secret with two. Think of it like this. Two shares the secret with three. Lastly, three shares the secret with four. Now, I've drawn this like a directed graph, but it actually is undirected. Yeah, this is what the real graph looks like. And now, when we go through these, I'm going to do something kind of intelligent. What I'm going to do is I'm going to check. Do either of these people know the secret? Nope, they don't. So skip it. Do either of these people know the secret? Nope. So skip it. Do either of these people know the secret? Yes, one does. So run a graph traversal starting at one because this is the graph of communications that happen at time equals five. Basically, at every single time point, we're going to build a graph such as this one. And now starting from time equals one, we know that person one can communicate with person two. So, OK, now this person knows the secret as well. Let's add them to the result. And now person two knows the secret. They can communicate with person three. That information was provided to us from the first edge. And now from person three, we can share the information with person four, which was provided to us via this edge. And we'll add these two to the solution set three and four. So now we are allowed to run a traversal starting from any of these. And in case there are additional edges in here, we will make sure to mark these as visited as we traverse them because we don't want to visit them again. Anytime we visit somebody, they have been marked in the secret result. And the way I'm actually going to be storing the secrets, like the people with the secrets, is not a list. I'm actually going to use a hash set because we can still insert in constant time and we can search that hash set in constant time as well to check if somebody is in the sorted or in the secret hash set or not. Now, before I code this up, let me just quickly show you what the graph would look like. Suppose if these were like disjointed, maybe here we have a five and a six at time equals five. And maybe here we have a seven and an eight at time equals five. In this case, the graph would be pretty simple. We'd have two to three. We'd have five to six and then we'd have seven to to eight. So the graph doesn't necessarily need to be connected. It could be disjointed like this. This is why another approach to solving this problem is with the disjoint set data structure, aka union find. That's how I usually refer to it. You know, DFS is relatively simple in this case, and I'll be analyzing the time complexity of DFS at the end. It's relatively efficient. I think the bottleneck is actually just going to be sorting the meetings based on time, which is going to be, I think, roughly M log M, where M is the number of meetings. But now let's just code this up. I'm going to initialize first a hash set called secrets. That's kind of the result that we're going to be returning. And so this is just people with the secret. And we know initially zero is always going to have the secret. So I'm going to have a zero here. And we know this person is also always going to have the secret. So let's add them as well. So I'm just passing a list into this set, which will convert that list into a hash set. But before we actually return it, you can see they want us to return a list. So when we take secrets, we are actually going to turn it into a list before we return it. Now, I'm actually going to split the uh, meetings based on time. So I'm going to have something called a time map. Maybe the name could be better, but basically this is going to map every single time to an adjacency list of the meetings that occur at that time. So that'll make it pretty easy for us to run the DFS on each of those adjacency lists. We can initialize this like this for every source destination time in the meetings. So we're unpacking all three of these from each meeting and then we're going to check. Well, if this time is not in the time map yet, let's go ahead and insert it like this. So we're mapping this time to a hash map, which in our case is going to be a default dictionary where the default value is going to be an empty list. So then we can go like this time map for this particular time. Let's go ahead and say to the source, let's append the destination and to the destination. Whoops. Let's append the source. Basically, this is the part where the edges are undirected. That's really important. When I was first coding this up, I missed the second part and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. Always make sure to read the fine print in the problem description. OK, now before I actually implement the DFS, I'm going to show you how we're going to call the DFS first. We want to go through the times in sorted order, but I haven't even sorted them yet. Well, I'm going to do it conveniently like this. First, I'm going to take all the keys in the time map. So that will give us the unique times because remember time was the key here. So we won't have any duplicates here. I'm going to take this and I'm going to sort it 
after I turn this into a list. I'm not even sure if we actually need to turn it into a list. I think we probably don't. I don't know the type that this returns. I don't think it's a list, but I think we can probably just do it like this without transforming it. So let's stick with this. So we're going through the times in sorted order. First, let's think of it this way. Let's get the time map at time t. This is an adjacency list. So in this adjacency list, we're, we kind of have every single edge within that adjacency list. So we want to consider every single key in this adjacency list and consider it as the source node. And for every single source node, we want to contemplate, should we run a DFS from this source or not? And remember, we only run a DFS if the source is in the secrets hash set because only then can the secret be spread from the source to the other nodes. So then we will here run a DFS. We don't want to have duplicates be revisited. That would make the DFS inefficient. We want to guarantee we only visit each node in that graph at most once. So we will declare a visit hash set up here. The fact that we do it here is very important. Do not declare it in here because then you'll basically be creating a new visit hash set every time we run a DFS. But we want to share that among all of the DFSs for this particular adjacency list. So for the DFS, I'm going to pass in the source node and I'm going to pass in visit. This is actually optional in Python to cut down how many variables we pass in, how many parameters or arguments we pass in here. I'm actually not going to pass visit in. You can if you want to, but this DFS will have access to every variable out here and here. I'm only going to pass in the source. I'm not going to pass in visit, but I am going to pass in time map at time equals t. We technically don't need to do that, but I think it just makes it significantly more readable if we have DFS here and we have this other variable called ADG, basically short for adjacency list, rather than from here having to refer to time map at t. So this just makes it a bit more readable. That's why I'm doing this. For the actual implementation here, it's not going to be super crazy. We don't want to visit the same node more than once. So if source is in visit, then return. Don't do another traversal from there. But if it's not been visited, then make sure to add it to the visit hash set. And also, let's make sure to add this to the secrets because the secret has just been communicated to this node. It's possible that the secret was already communicated to it, which in that case, we won't end up adding duplicates here because we intelligently used a hash set rather than a list. So there we go there. Now for the recursive step, we're going to go through every neighbor of the source node. And we can do that really easily like this. In the adjacency list, get all of the neighbors of the source node. For every single neighbor, run a DFS on that neighbor and also pass in the adjacency list. This DFS has access to the visit hash set that was declared over here. Before we call DFS, it also has access to secrets, which was declared up there. Now, if you want to, you could pass those variables in to the function. It's up to you, whatever makes more sense. But zooming out, you can see that this is the entire code. On the left, you can see it does work and it is pretty efficient. So let me actually analyze the time complexity. Here we're building a hash map, but the size of the hash map is going to be proportionate to the number of meetings. So you can think of the space complexity as being big O of M. Technically, you could say it's also big O of N, where N is the number of people. We could technically have more people than there are meetings if every single meeting has two people, but I think they're proportional, so it doesn't really matter too much in my opinion. And of course, the space complexity partially comes from the visit hash set, but the bottleneck, I think, is going to be time map. So you could think of this as the space complexity. In terms of time complexity, going through every meeting, that's definitely not the bottleneck because we're actually sorting the time keys. In the worst case, we could have a time for every single meeting. So you can say the time complexity is big O of M log M. And we also will potentially go through every single person, even with the graph traversal, even though there's no repeated work. So you could think of this as being M log M plus N. But again, I think this is actually sufficient for the time complexity because M is going to be proportionate to the number of people we have. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.